And so I knew you were coming in to do some filming and I was wandering into work thinking about what to talk about and it was raining and I was getting a bit wet. But as I was wandering along, I just started idly thinking about rain and in particular why it is that raindrops are kind of that big rather than that big. I guess it sort of starts by what sizes raindrops actually are and in particular the fact that they're, they're not actually all the same size. There is a distribution of raindrop size. And in fact, the, some of the early work on this was done by a guy called Wilson Bentley. He was a fascinating guy. He was kind of a, a, an autodidact. He taught himself all the science he did. He was fascinated by science. Uh, he was a farmer from Vermont at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, he was really interested in things that fell out of the sky. So for example, he made sort of the definitive set of photographs of snowflakes and was really the person who showed that snowflakes are all different shapes. But one of the other things he looked at was rain and he measured with a rather elegant experiment the sizes of the drops that fall out of the sky in different types of rainfall. So he had this very neat experiment. He, he took a, a, a tray full of flour, so sort of fairly shallow layer of flour in a tray, uh, just put it out in the rain for a couple of seconds, pulled it back in again, and so the raindrops would kind of fall in and soak some of the flour. He'd then wait for the little pellets that kind of formed out of that to dry and then pick them out of the flower. And then the sizes of the pellets told him about the size of the raindrops. Like in a, in a ratio or were they the same? Like, I think sort of coincidentally, they turn out to be, so he, he did the proper thing. So, you know, the scientific experiment is you then calibrate your results. So he actually took drops of known size and dropped them from varying heights into flower and found out what sizes of pellets they made. And he found that basically the size of the pellets corresponded almost exactly to the size of the drop that fell in in the first place. So just by measuring the, the sort of size distribution of the pellets, he was able to find out about the size distribution of the rain. I actually have his paper here. So here's his paper where he explains his experiments and so on. But he actually has photographs of some of his experiments showing what the raindrops look like. Huh. And you can see, again, this sort of ranges of different sizes, some little drops, some big drops. But he also found that sometimes the, the size distribution was more uniform, sometimes there were bigger drops, sometimes there were smaller drops. Um, so he basically found that, it, it, the, the, as a rule of thumb, the heavier the rain was, the bigger the drops are. Um, but beyond that, he quite found quite a variety of different outcomes. He was indeed the pioneer in this, and people then went on to make more quantitative measurements and sort of started finding sort of empirical rules. So here's a paper, again, one of the definitive papers on this, which is actually only one page long, by uh, Marshall and Palmer in 1948. And what they found is that in, with different rates of rainfall, so this is the sort of the number of drops versus drop size. So what they found is that there were lots of little drops and then many fewer bigger drops. And in fact, this is a log scale up here. So this is actually, you know, this is a hundred times as many drops this size as there are this size. So it's, this is actually, because this comes out as a straight line on this scale, that means it's actually an exponential distribution. There are lots and lots of little ones and not very many big ones. It always follows this same kind of distribution but the sort of calibration of it depends on how heavy the rainfall is, that, that in, in heavier rain you get bigger drops. There's something very beautiful about like just humans studying rain. It is, although it actually it turns out it has applications too. So for example, one of the issues about uh, radio wave propagation, so if you're trying to uh, broadcast radio or if you've got radar, it's affected by raindrops and it depends on the size distribution of the raindrops and actually the shapes of the raindrops as well. So there is actually a, a sort of a practical application as well as it just being an interesting thing to find out about the world. So now we need to sort of get to the bottom of why raindrops are the size they are and why they grow to a certain size and no bigger, which means we kind of need to go back and look at the physics a bit more about how raindrops grow in the first place. Okay, so you have a cloud and a raindrop will start to form and really, so this is a sort of a, a cloud of water vapor and it's gonna start condensing. So to start condensing typically you need something which sort of seeds the condensation. So it's thought that a, just a, a tiny little grain of dust or something is there in the cloud, which water then will start to settle on. So you start forming a drop. And that drop will grow, there'll be more, you know, more water will, will grow onto that drop and also drops will crash into each other. So they'll grow both by sort of accreting stuff from the vapor, but also by smashing into each other and growing into bigger drops that way. And as they start to grow, they start out as completely round. And the physics as to why they're completely round is to do with surface tension. The surface tension sort of pulls the thing into a, into a sphere. What happens, maybe I should draw a picture for this. Can okay. I draw a picture? Yeah, of course. Let's have a picture. If you've got a, a water molecule, if it's in the middle of the, the water, it's surrounded by lots of other water molecules and they're all pulling it towards them. And so basically there's no net force on our water molecule in the middle here. But if you get near the surface, you've got a water molecule here, then there's more molecules below it than there are above it. 
And that means there's a sort of imbalanced force. There's more things pulling it downwards than there are pulling it upwards. So if you can imagine trying to take an individual water molecule and pull it up to the surface, in here you can move it around how you like, but as you get closer to the surface, the other water molecules are trying to pull it back down again. So you actually have to do some work to get it up near the surface. You're actually having to fight quite hard to get it to the surface. That actually means there's energy stored in the water molecules close to the surface. And so the more surface area you have, the more energy, potential energy, there is stored up there. And nature, being kind of lazy, prefers to have the lowest energy state. And so therefore the lowest energy state for any uh, collection of water is the one that minimizes the amount of energy stored near the surface, which means you basically want to minimize the surface area of the object. And for any given blob of water, the shape which minimizes the surface en energy is a sphere. And so that's why small amounts of water will arrange themselves into spheres, because surface tension makes that the lowest energy solution, and that's, so that's how it ends up being distributed. Does that mean we need a seed, like a, as a grain of dust or something, for every raindrop? I think there has to be, yes, because the raindrops have to know where to form. So there's something special about that place, which, of which the simplest thing is just a tiny little grain of dust. Probably microscopic in size, but there's just something up there which makes it seed at that particular point. Okay, so you made your drop, it starts out being spherical because of the surface tension effects. It's then starting to fall, and that means that basically from the raindrop's perspective, the air is kind of rushing up past it. And at that point, we have to start worrying about aerodynamics. Now, we made a whole video about lift and aerodynamics and what have you, and perhaps the only lesson from that is that aerodynamics is really rather complicated. And this is even more complicated because it's not like a wing or anything, something like that, which is a fixed shape. This is a raindrop, which means that as the air rushes past it, it can rearrange its shape. So not only do you have to worry about the flow of air, but you have to worry about what it's doing to the shape of the object. Like, so, a, like a wing made of jelly. Exactly, and not surprisingly, you know, you've got quite a lot of air pressure and things happening. It will deform and you'll end up with, a, with the thing no longer being spherical. That's where we get our beautiful raindrop shape from. <laughs> Sadly not, no. So you'd think so because, of, you know, raindrop, nice aerofoil shape. Turns out that's not the shape you end up with. And although the physics is really rather complicated, it, there's a quite a simple way to think about it, which is that as the thing is falling, this kind of air pressure, from its perspective, it's being pushed from below. And so what the, the, the simplest thing that starts to happen is it just starts to flatten at the bottom. And so now the air keeps flowing around it, but now it's got, kind of got a, a flat bottom to it. So it's like a hamburger bun shape, it ends up being. Sort of still round on the top, but flat on the bottom. So then that process sort of continues, the pressure below keeps going, and what happens is it actually starts to, the, the bottom starts, isn't even flat, it starts to turn uh, concave. Um, and at that point, air kind of gets trapped inside the thing, and your whole raindrop actually blows up like a little balloon, with a, with a kind of a ring of water at the bottom of it. And then, not surprisingly, the surface tension is not enough to hold the thing together, and then it bursts into a thousand little fragments. So you can't actually have a big raindrop because it's unstable in that way. The air pressure will kind of blow it up and make it explode. It almost is acting like a parachute. It is, yeah. And so let me show you a picture. These really are fascinating. Cute thing. So here's some experiments, and, and this, so this is still an active area of research. This is a, an, uh, an article in Nature Physics, which is one of the more you know, prestigious journals in physics from 2009. And so here's the picture. Here's our large raindrop starting to fall. It gets flatter as it falls. Then you can see at some point it actually starts to inflate. This little bag forms above it. The surface tension holds it together for a little while. Then it bursts, and, the, and then the, actually the ring that's left behind fragments as well, and you end up with many, many tiny fragments. So at what point in the journey are we? Is, is it still up in the cloud here? Has it fallen at 10 miles? Like, what, how long does this take? It depends how big, how quickly it grows big. So if you have a raindrop that grows big very quickly, this happens very early on. If you have raindrops which stay small, this process will never happen. It'll actually just stay sort of raindrop shaped and keep falling. Um, so it really is when the things grow above a, a millimetre or so in size, that's when this, these processes start to happen. When they shatter into lots of small fragments, what happens to those fragments? So in principle, if there was time, the whole process would start all over again and it would start, they would start growing again. The interesting thing, and the point of this paper actually, is that the distribution of these fragment sizes is exactly the same as the distribution that these guys found of what was actually hitting the ground. So the, the hypothesis they come up with this in, in this paper is that actually what happens is that, the, that this process only happens once. That the rain, large raindrop forms, it shatters, into this distribution of smaller fragments, and those are the things which fall on your head at the ground level. 
And that then, the size distribution of these then matches the distribution that we see in actual raindrops. So those, the fragments, the shrapnel that lands on us doesn't go through the balloon process again. It looks like it, and they argue just on the basis of the time scales that there isn't time. You can figure out the amount of time it takes a raindrop to fall to the ground and then sort of do some calculations as to how quickly it should grow. And the answer is it does, just doesn't have time to go through that cycle again. Mike, it feels like this ballooning and shrapnel process would happen so quickly and clouds seem so high up in the sky that you'd feel like this would go through lots of iterations, but, but no. I think the issue is that in a cloud you have a lot of water vapour, which means that actually things can happen very quickly. By the time that things are in that, this sort of freefall phase, there isn't that much water around. So the chances of things bumping into each other are much lower, the chances of more water accreting onto your drop are much lower. So there just isn't time for these processes to happen. They happen quite quickly in the clouds because there's just a lot of water there. But by the time the things are falling, there's lots of gaps between the water and so it doesn't happen again. But I thought the shrapnel pieces would have the chance to go through the balloon process, or are they too small for that now? No, so they're now back in this regime where the, the surface tension is the winning force, so that they will then turn back into these more or less spherical things. So the raindrops which fall on your head probably are more or less round. Hey everyone, Professor Mike Merrifield, who you just watched in this video, well he's an astronomer. You can see even more of his videos here on 60 Symbols, or our special astronomy channel Deep Sky Videos. There are links on the screen and in the description, of course. But Mike's also become the unofficial weatherman of 60 Symbols. He's done videos on lightning and rainbows and clouds. There's a whole playlist. Again, there's a link on the screen and down in the description.